Well, good afternoon. It's uh, 12 16, uh, one minute after start time on September 25th, 2017. Just three shopping months till Christmas. Uh, this is math uh, 227. Did you get it taken care of? What's that? I said the bad news is my class is going to be wrong. Right. But the um, good news is I got until Wednesday. Right. To get my class is back, but I also got to have a full payment on Wednesday. Right. Which I'm pretty close now, so I mean. Well, I heard someone say, I don't know, they that I would go by what they said, but they said if you pay at least half, they can keep you in the class. but. Oh, really? No, well, that's just what someone said, whether that was, if she told you you had to have full payment by, by uh, Wednesday, then I guess you do, but, you know, I would say pay whatever you can yeah, by I Wednesday. Mean, if, I, mean, I got more than half. I'm probably about missing two months, too. What's that? I said I got more than half right now. Yeah, well, I, I would say pay all that you can on Wednesday. I don't think they'll drop you permanently, but they may, I, I guess, swear it, but. At least you can stay in one class because you're registered for two, right? Yes, sir. Right, so do what you can. And if you can get all of them by Wednesday, do so. Uh, because that would be the safest thing. All right. <clears throat> all right, we, I just was getting ready to get started on this. Uh, now, you were out this last week. That's when I was telling all the students to be sure to get the paper done. Yeah. I, I was hoping you were listening to it on on YouTube because you would have heard it. I was out, uh, I had to work last weekend. I was out of town in Mississippi under construction. Uh -huh. I built build a building. And um, I had to drive to Mississippi because I know I had to get to the class bay anymore, so right. I, had, I had to work out of town to get the paper. Right. Done. Okay. Well, uh, anyway. Uh, if you had listened to YouTube, you probably would have heard that then, but the, uh, uh, we get it done as soon as you can. All right, uh, where we left off last time, we were on in section 13.2. This is on page 701. Um, we were doing example five, and we had done just about all of example five um, but the we had done all the hard part of it really it said, said find a parameterization of the tangent line at t is equal to pi fourths okay it said to plot um, let me go on and blow this up all right it said the plot R of t, and that, this is a graph of that, which is cosine t sine t for cosine squared t, okay? Together with its tangent vectors at pi fourths, and there it is, and 3 has pi. There that one is. And then it said the last part, find a parameterization of the tangent line at pi fourths, okay? So... I wish we still had all the things there. I don't want to recalculate them, but it, it's not hard to do. So to find the parameterization of the tangent line at pi fourths, well, the tangent line must be uh, on the line. I mean, a, a tangent line, that's the only place it touches the line is at the point on the curve, okay? So if we plug in pi fourths here, which we did last time, we will get one point on that tangent line. And what would that be? Let me get my pen back to dark. So what is R of pi fourths? Okay, R of pi fourths. R of t, anywhere t, is cosine t sine t for cosine squared t. Okay, so when, when t is pi fourths, 
what is R? What's cosine of pi force? Cosine of pi force and uh, square root of 2 over 2. Absolutely. So that would be square root of 2 over 2. Sine of pi force. Square root of 2 over 2. And cosine of pi force, or square root of 2 over 2, squared would be which is 1 over 1 over 2 and then multiply 4 by that and you get 2 alright so there is a point on that and we did this last time you can imagine coming out of uh, square root of uh, now we've got this oriented that way square root of 2 over 2 here, square root of 2 over 2 there, and then go up 2. Okay? So there's a point on the tangent line. The next thing we need to know is the slope of the tangent line. How do we get that? We did this last time. Our prime of t, that'll give us the slope, right? Would be what? Negative sine t, comma, cosine t, comma, okay, you treat that as a function, so 2 oh, times so 4 is, like, huh? So it's like 8. 8. Yeah, you're going to wind up with a negative. Sine, sine t. Cosine t, because it's, okay, 2 times this would be 8, drop that by 1, cosine t, times the root of the cosine t would be minus sine t. Oh, okay. Change rule, get them all in there, okay? Now we got to figure out what that is, r prime of t times r prime at pi fourths. What would that be? That would be no, I don't know. Yes, you did. You already told me what sine of pi fourths was. Yeah, so it'd be minus root two over two. Yeah. I'm, I'm just slightly confused. See what we're doing is plugging in instead of t, we're plugging in a pi fourth. Oh, okay. All right, there we go. Okay. Right. What's that? All right, now it's on square root two over two. Square root of two over two. Negative four. Because we already know what sine t cosine t would be root two over another way to think of it rather than root two over two is one over root two. Same thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So one over root two times one over root two is uh, one over two. Yeah. And half the negative eight over four. Yeah. Okay. So there's the slope at that point. Okay? Now it said get a parameterization uh, of the tangent line at t equal pi force. And if you go back, it was in, I think, chapter 11 or 12, I don't remember which one, how you do your parameterization of the line. I don't think it was earlier in this chapter. Let me just see. It may have been. It may have been 13.1. 
No, I don't think so. I think it was back earlier. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the parameterization of it, they call L of T. I'm not really sure why they call it L of T. They just do, and that's a vector. And that would be R of T. I'm sorry. Okay. Now, here's where... I find the way the book's doing it awkward, at least. They ought to come up with a new parameterization. We've already been using T here. This T is not the same as that T. So why use T again? You've got plenty of letters in the alphabet. I would choose S, okay? Or something else, just anything not T. Of course, not anything that makes sense otherwise. S. That would be your R at, and I'll go on rather than confusing it with the T's here, that would be R at pi fourths. That gives you the point there, plus S, that's the parameter, times R prime at pi fourths. Okay? In other words, that gives you the slope. So it's sort of like, this is kind of like a point slope form. Uh, the slope times the variable plus the point, that gives you a line. Okay? And that's what we did before. So what we do here is plug in what we know. And this will be R of T is root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2, comma 2, plus S times negative root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, negative 4. Okay? And that's a perfectly good way to leave it. I see no reason to do anything else. The only place I differ from the book is they put a t in here and here, which is okay variable, but we've already just used t here. Why use the same one when they don't mean the same thing? So even though you're not using keys for the rest of it, just to keep from confusing the issue, pick that new variable and put it in. I've got a new parameter. So that is your uh, a parameterization of the tangent uh, line. Because you know the point that it goes from, and you know its slope, which is what you multiply by your parameter t. And you so, in a sense, uh, I hope this won't get me in serious trouble later. <laughs> in a sense, sort of like the variable is for a function, an algebraic function, the parameter is for a linearization. It's, that's the variable, and then the other part gives you the numbers, which is the constant and the... the uh, Slope, basically, which is what the potential factor gives you. Okay. So I think we're ready for example six. Any questions on this before we leave it? Okay. Now, this is one lousy <laughs> slide. I, 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 don't, I just can't believe how poor the slides are. In this. Number one, it's so tiny. Well, then why do they have the graph over here and the thing here? Why is it this underneath the graph? It is in the book. So why did they do it here? I don't know. But I'll get it all in one big zoom, but it looks even dumber then, but we'll do it. Okay. Don't know why it's like this. So the horizontal tangent vectors on a cycloid. The function r of t is equal to, they didn't, they've got it in the book, but they don't have it written here. So as soon as I do this, it's going to sort of shrink back. So let's do it. r of t is equal to the vector, and this is a two-dimensional uh, system here, 
a cycloid is a two-dimensional graph. T minus sine T is the uh, X component of it. And 1 minus cosine T is the Y component of it. Okay? It's a two-dimensional figure. Okay. That traces a cycloid. Ah, goodness. I worked a lot this weekend, and right now I'm so stiff and sore, my back just wants to be stretched. And uh, I'm also cold in here. I don't know. Are you chilly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that makes it tie up, you know, tighten up even worse. Ugh. Okay. It says, find the points where r prime of t is horizontal and non-zero. So there's the first part. We want where r of r prime of t uh, is horizontal. And not equal to zero. Okay, the r prime is not equal to zero. So what guess... Guess what we got to do first? Calculate the first derivative. So, can you? Yeah. What would it be? It would be um, 1 minus cosine. And then uh, 0, uh, well, it would be Negative sign. Yeah, but, oh, I'm sorry. Positive. Yeah. Positive sign. Yeah, because derivative of minus cosine is positive sign. Okay. Now, we want where this is horizontal. Okay. Now, what, goodness gracious, how cold. Uh, what is going to make that horizontal? No, you're, I think you're right on the money there. It's where the y value is zero. Is zero. That all you have is an x component. Yeah. You're not going up or down with y, so it has to be zero. Okay? And that's exactly what you want. So what are those values where sine t is equal to zero? Uh, pi. Say again? Pi. Okay. That's certainly one. And um, 2 pi. 2 pi. Yeah. Okay, every pi, including zero pi, so zero, right? However, it didn't say just where it's horizontal, but it's where it's horizontal and not equal to zero. Uh, uh, I think they misstated that, <laughs> okay. Where r prime of t is horizontal and non-zero. Okay, I think what they mean is r r prime is horizontal yeah I guess they, and and the zero vector okay and not the zero vector okay they just say and not zero and non-zero, I think they mean, and not the zero vector. So at zero, one minus cosine zero, what is cosine zero? One, so one minus one is zero. And this would be zero. So that's the zero vector there. We don't want that, okay? We only want the places where it's horizontal, but not the zero. Well, at pi, this will be this will be two then. Be one minus cosine of pi yeah. is minus one. Yeah. So be one minus one minus one plus one plus one is two. So that would be not zero then. And again, it's zero zero at, at two pi, but it's uh, two zero at, at three pi. So every other one. Uh, so the at the pi three pi five pi seven pi. So the odd pi's that would fit the bill here. Okay, and only at the odd. 
clearly, <coughs> and only at the odd pies. Okay. Now, so pi three pi five pi and so forth. Now the B part. <coughs> sorry. The B part says where R prime is a zero vector. So that's the other ones, okay? And where is R prime the zero vectors? So that it would be non-zero, horizontal and non-zero, at T equal pi, 3 pi, 5 pi, dot, 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 okay? Where would it be the zero vector? That R prime would be the zero vector. I didn't realize that's what the next question was, so I've already said it. What would that be? At T equal I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, where would that first derivative of the R prime of T be the zero vector? Pi, four pi, dot dot dot. Okay, that's where it'll be the even vectors, uh, the even pies. Okay. Now, this picture here is a picture of a cycloid. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with where this comes from, but have you run into them before? Cycle? Yeah. I heard it. Okay. If you were to take uh, a something like a sharpie, but a real short one, and put it in the tread of your tire or, or somehow fix it on a tire. So it traced as you travel. It, it's on the wheel of the tire. And if the tire is at radius one, then down here it's touching the road right there. And then as the tire is moving that way, that's what the X component is telling you. Okay, as the tire is moving that way, your Y component of that Sharpie or whatever it is that's making the mark is going up and reaches twice the radius there, right? Because now it moves to the top side and then moves down and up and down and up and down. That would be the, what is the path of any point on a tire or a wheel or any circle that's moving, okay? Now, Flip that over, and what you have are power lines, <laughs> basically. Uh, something awfully close to it. Um, if you, you flip that over, especially in the summertime when they have maximum stretch in them because of E because it's linear expansion, uh, they hang lower, and they let hang in the pattern of a cycle. Okay. And there's just a whole bunch of interesting physical characteristics of something like that. I mean, it's just uh, an object rolling down that, that curve, if, if it could balance on there, it would be at a, uh, let me see if I can remember right, a constant speed. Because most of the time when you're in free fall or anything close to it, you're accelerating the speed. But this is going to, the tension on it and, and things like this keeps it at a constant speed, I believe. I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, so there's just 
ton of really interesting things about applications of cycloids in there. When you flip it over, it's called something else, a brachia, not a brachia pod or something like that. It's sort of a bizarre little thing. Um, but this cycloid, they say, has sharp points or cusps at the points of the even pi, 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, and so on. If we represent the cycloid as a graph of a function y is equal to f of x, then f prime of x does not exist at those points because your first derivative is basically vertical at those points, so therefore it would be a change of y over a zero change of x, which would be uh, undefined. So the, the, uh, the slope is undefined at those points. Uh, excuse me. Uh, if we represent the cycloid as a graph of a function, why is it? Okay, no, we already read that. Okay. By contrast, the vector derivative r prime of t equal 1 minus cosine t sine t uh, exists for all values. Sorry. Ah, my head is messing up. <clears throat> okay. For all values of t, but r prime of t is 0 at the cusp, the 0 vector at the cusp. In general, r prime is the direction of the vector of the tangent line whenever it exists, but we get no information about the... Uh, magnitude of that uh, okay let me start that one in general r prime of t is a direction vector uh, for the tangent whenever it takes on uh, any values r of t uh, but r prime of t is zero at the cusp. We already said that. In general, r prime of t is a direction vector. Okay, that's where it is. Uh, tangent line wherever it exists, but we get no information about the tangent line at r prime of zero because it's not defined there. So that's, I was trying to find some sense in it, and it just seems to be repeating the obvious. So sorry. Okay, let's move on to example seven, which I think. Yeah, we it may have a thing. Uh, example 7 says, prove that if R of T has a constant length, okay? So R of T is a constant, okay? Constant magnitude. Okay, constant magnitude. If that's true, then R of T, if that's true, then R of T is perpendicular or orthogonal to R prime of T. Okay. Okay. inclination is to define this and say that any time that r of t is a constant magnitude, no matter which direction that r goes, it's always a constant magnitude. That basically outlines a sphere. If it goes back, here, front, down, up, wherever, if it's constant magnitude, you just describe a sphere. Okay? Now, you don't need to go to that first, but it sort of helps what we're going to do later. To, to make it make more sense, okay? Now, sorry. Now, what is the magnitude? Oh, wow. 
the magnitude is the absolute or is the, well, it's the magnitude of our sorry yeah it's just uh, I've got sort of hiccups that it, it just feels weird okay okay um, that's your definition of magnitude okay and if that's a constant that implies also that this is constant you know the magnitude squared now we know what the magnitude squared is okay the magnitude squared is the dot product of a vector with itself now, that was from the last chapter I believe yeah wasn't it uh yeah yeah cross product dot dot product was 12.3 cross product 12.4 or at least somewhere in there okay so if r of t is a constant magnitude that means the magnitude is is constant which means the first derivative i mean that the uh the square of that magnitude is constant and the square of the magnitude is r of t dotted with itself okay that is what the square of the magnitude is okay and that's my nose is itching now if that's a constant then d by dt must be zero right if the magnitude is a constant then the square of the uh, of its magnitude would be a constant now um, so let's do this let's do d by dt of this thing okay by the product rule for for derivatives okay and and dot product do you remember how that goes? The dot product? Yeah. The derivative of a dot product. Uh, yeah. It's the uh, it's the first one times the derivative of sigma. So R T times the derivative of sigma R T. And uh, plus Okay. Plus, plus the first derivative of the vector RT. Yeah. Okay. Which it's the same thing, right? Yeah. It's uh, two times R of T dot dr. I forgot to put my vectors on there and there. Uh, in the hair um, okay okay and we know that's equal to zero because the derivative of that is zero okay well here we have the vector not in with its derivative which is what we were asked to prove and we can rewrite this as r prime of t if we choose and if that product is zero that means r of t must be perpendicular to r prime of t okay and that really is all that's required of it okay now, this figure really went with the graphical insight, and here's what it says. The result of example uh, 7 has geometric explanation. Uh, the vector parameterization R of T consisting of vectors of constant length, capital R, traces a curve on the surface of a sphere of tangent radius R with its center at the origin. And that's what this is showing, okay? Uh, 
thus uh, r prime of t is tangent to the sphere at any place because the the first derivative, the tangent, uh, or the first derivative is perpendicular to the the function itself by that, and therefore they the tangent line is tangent to that circle. Okay. Uh, seems like they almost went around in circle there, but it's fine. Okay. Now, it's a little ahead of the thing. Uh, I hate to do this, but I need to, to run down and, and clear my head because it, oh, okay. this cool air blowing on me or sky. Hope I can get through it with no nothing else. Okay. Um, so they did the other part first. I started by telling you it's the traces of sphere. They then did the conceptual insight. I'm sorry. Sorry. Graphical insight. Uh, result of example seven is that it sh <coughs> <coughs> shows this figure that when you are a constant magnitude from the center, then the velocity vector is always perpendicular to the displacement vector. All right. Whew. Now we, yeah. Hey, do you just want to just call it a day? It's like, I actually need to go to to my um, boss real quick, see how can make the rest of the class, make the rest of the Well, I, I would keep talking even if you weren't here, because um, I'm going to record this for uh, Jasmine and Victor both, if, uh, since they're not here either, so I, I don't want to get any further behind, because we had a lot of catching up to do, so if you need to go, you can go, but I'm just, I'm going to keep going, don't stop. Don't go because of me, because I'm going to keep talking as long as I can. All right. Well, I'm probably going to head out because I'm going to be discussing Okay. Will you be back for differential equations or probably not? Probably most likely not, but there is like a couple of questions today. Yeah. How much time do I left to the time is over? What's that? I'm going to stay until this class is over with, and then I'm going to leave. Okay. All right. Sorry that I've lost some time here. All right. So this has been talking about upfleet now. The, the, the title of this section, Calculus Vector Valued Functions. What we've done so far is the derivatives of that. The second part here, which is like a page, is vector value integration, which again is pretty straightforward. The integral in a vector value function can be defined in terms of Riemann sums, as in back in Chapter 5 when you did it at, in, at the end of Cal 1, beginning of Cal 2. We will define it more simply via component-wise integration. Again, I'll say it again. I've said it before several times. Everything you do with vectors really works best if you do it component by component by component. You differentiate by components like we were doing. You integrate by components. You add by components. I mean, you can do the other things like the geometrical and stuff, but it just makes it so much easier and so much more straightforward to do it by components. Okay? So, uh, they're going to lead up to this theorem 4, but just to have a place to write, I'll, I'll put what they've got here. If you have a vector, a, a function, a vector function, r of t, and you're integrating this from a to b, where t is going from a to b, so that you're integrating with respect to t, and r is a vector, and thus r vector is x of t, y of t, z of t, if it's a three-dimensional vector, Okay, then if you're integrating this, you're simply doing the integral of a to b x of t, 
dt, comma, integral from a to b, y of t, dt, integral from a to b of z of t, dt. Okay, close the angle bracket. Okay, so basically what we're saying, this is integrating the vector, which that's not the area of the curve of the vector, so don't think in those old terms, but write that as its components, and then integrate the components, and now this is a scalar, scalar, scalar. We know how to do scalar integration. So you do it, but now each one of those, the integrals of each one becomes the components of your uh, integrated vector function. Now they didn't give a name for it, but that could have been capital R of T or something like that. So let's do a real life one, okay? Integrate from zero to pi of the vector one T sine T dt. Okay? What do you think that would be? Well, the first one would be t. t. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. So that would be, and it, it's a vector though, so you express it as a vector. t evaluated from 0 to pi, yeah. comma, zero to pi, and for yeah. some reason my two just decided to disappear, comma. And, um, I was this, was it negative cosine? No, cosine. Cosine? No, 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 you're integrating, you're right, negative cosine. Yeah, antiderivative is negative cosine. Oh, evaluated from zero to pi, okay? So what would this be? That would be pi. Pi, comma. Right, comma. Uh, minus one. Minus one. Okay. Minus one. Minus one. Okay. Minus a oh, negative okay. one. Yeah, negative one. This is just one. Okay. But you got to evaluate the bottom too. These two you didn't because those were t's. And plug in a zero, you get a zero. Oh, yeah. But here, if you plug in a t, you don't get a zero. So for the bottom, you have a minus a minus one. Yes, you got it. Okay. So what that is is pi pi squared over two comma and this uh, turns out being a plus one plus one is two. Okay. Uh, minus signs and Milton had super many pi minus signs, but yeah. They write it as pi, one half pi squared, two. Yeah, that's what you get. Okay, vector value integrals obey the same linearity rules as scalar value integrals. Uh, so you can pull out any constant that's in the front. You can add them. You can do all the things that you normally do. An antiderivative of the vector r of t is a vector value function capital R of t such that r prime of capital R prime of t is equal to little r of t, okay? In the single variable case, two functions, f1 and f2 with the same derivative, differ by a constant, just like it was with any integration, okay? Similarly, two vector value functions with the same derivative differ by a constant vector, not a constant, but a constant vector, i.e. a vector that does not depend on your independent variable t. This is proved by applying the scalar result to each component of r, and this is in the theorem that you get from that. I'm just going to leave this writing here and just blow up the part of interest here. Okay, theorem 4. If capital R1 of t and capital R2 of t are both differentiable functions, and r1 prime of t is equal to r2 prime of t, then r1 of t and r2 of t 
differ by some constant vector, let's say bold C, not just a constant, but a constant vector, for some constant vector C, bold C. If I were writing that, I'd put an arrow there, but there in white bold, I can't. Okay. So, let's do example eight. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, let's try to use their slides as much as possible. The fundamental, <coughs> the general, well, that was exactly what we said before from here. Not quite, but almost the same. The general antiderivative of R of t is given by the integral. When you don't have limits, that's an indefinite integral or a general integral, R of t dt is going to be some capital R, also a vector, of t plus some constant vector. Okay. Very similar to what we, this is down here, but not quite the same, but very, very close where C may be some vector, C1, comma, C2, comma, C3, if you're in three dimensions, okay? Um, so, let's go back to the one we just did, but when we had limits, but let's do it as if we didn't have limits. Okay, the integral of, I'll put parentheses, that should be a vector, of 1t sine t, wasn't it? Yeah, dt, okay, but this time we don't have limits, so what would that be? t. t. plus some constant vector, and I'll write it as C1, C2, C3, okay? Since we are using three dimensions, we will, okay? Um, so, if we carry that through to its logical extension, be t plus c1 is the first component, t squared over 2 plus c2, and c3 minus cosine t. Okay. So that would be the... Oh, so you can like terms? Yeah, yeah. You, when you're adding vectors, you add the component on it, just like yeah. integrating. You integrate the component or differentiate you do that, so since this is all you got, it's from this plus that, this plus that, yeah. so those would be the two components. Okay. So, but either either way is fine, it's just writing it inside one might. Okay. So that leads to the fundamental theorem of calculus for vectored value functions. All right. If you remember this from basically in the Cal 1, beginning of Cal 2, wherever you may have hit it, when you're in scalar values, scalar functions, but the vector function is the fundamental theorem of calculus, the vector vector function. If R of t is continuous on some interval a to b, and R prime of t is the antiderivative of that R of t, this is what we've been doing already. Then if this is the antiderivative of this is capital R of t, then you evaluate it first as b, subtract from a, and evaluate it a. That we call the fundamental theorem of calculus part one before they're just saying it's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, nothing too new, okay? Uh, is this example eight? I think it is. 
finding a position via a vector value differential equation. Okay? Now, to me, this should be in a differential equation course, but we'll go on and do it now. Here it is. dr dt is equal to this. 1 minus 6 sine 3t Okay, oops, comma, one fifth T. Okay. Find the particle, and by the way, this is a two dimensional vector, just one, comma, two terms in it, two components in it. Okay, find the particle's location at time t equal 4 if r of 0 is 4, 1. Okay, now, this is the derivative of the vector, okay, uh, to find the vector itself, and what we do is integrate. <coughs> Oh, this doesn't quite seem right, but it is it is okay to do. dr is equal to 1 minus 6 sine 3t comma 1 fifth t evaluated. Oh, I'm sorry. Jumping ahead too much. dt. I mean, it looks like we multiply both sides by dt. Well, that's the operator. You don't really do that. You just wrote that in differential form. Okay? And then, what do we do? We integrate both of these. Okay? Well, we integrate dr, and you just get the vector r. r of t. Okay? That's all you get. 1 dr is r. Okay? Now, Integrating this, let's uh, let's do integration term by term. Antiderivative of one. Oh, uh, uh, R. Only it's t. We're yeah, using yeah. T. t minus antiderivative yeah. Okay. Second. It's a, it's a DT here. So that's yeah. I left the blank here. So the antiderivative of sine is a minus cosine three T, but then we we wind up dividing by the three. So that 6 divided by 3 would be 2. Right? Yeah. Okay. Now, always, if you're not certain about it, take the derivative of this. Derivative of this is 1. Derivative of this is 2. Uh, minus 2. Sine 3t times 3 minus 6. Sine 3t. And that's exactly what we've got. Okay. So there's the... The first component, comma, uh, and then, uh, I don't know about that. I can't remember. Okay. Just pull the one fifth out. Yeah. What's the antiderivative of T? t squared over 2, so let's just change that 5 to a 10, right? Yeah. Okay. So that would be, just right, it's t squared over 10. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Hey, I just forgot. Right? Okay. 
and check that by 2 times 1 tenth is 1 fifth t to the first power 1 fifth t. Yeah. But since it's an indefinite integral, you have to also do some c1, c2. Two dimensional integration, so you only have two dimensional constants. Okay, but they told us, uh, 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 sorry, that r of 0 is equal to the vector 4, 1. So r of 0 is equal to the vector 4, 1. Well, let's plug in a 0 here. The... Uh, When t is equal to 0, that part, this first term is 0, plus 2 times the cosine of uh, 3 times 0. What's cosine of 0? 1. So it would be 0 plus 2. Okay. Comma. And when you plug in a 0, you get 0. Okay plus C1, C2, okay? But for that to be true, C1 must be two plus C1 is four. C1 must be two. two. Okay. And C2, okay, yeah, is 1. Okay, so then our R of T is equal to T plus 2 cosine 3T. Uh, plus 2, because that's your C1, comma, T squared over 10, plus 1. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah, that's supposed to be an angle there. It doesn't look very angly. So let's see what we got. T plus 2 cosine 3 T plus 2 comma 10 T 1 tenth T squared plus 1. Yeah. Now that's R N E T. What they asked for, the problem said, what is the location when t is equal to 4. So then our r of 4 is equal to 4 plus 2 cosine This is an R of T with a constant in there, yeah. two dimensional constant. But we knew R of 0 was a 4 1, so we figured this at T equals 0, that at T equals 0, and then brought down this, and that gave us R of T any T was T plus 4 thing plus 2. Yeah, yeah, that, that gave us C1 was 2, C1 was. C2 was 1, uh, so it's okay. I guess I didn't write it down. Oh, I did. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, oh, we calculated this to be, so this gave us T plus, two plus C2, which is 1, T squared plus 10 plus 1, which is your C2. So this is your R of T at any value T. Let's now calculate that at 4. T equal 4. So, I need angle bracket in front. 
didn't mean to leave that off. That would be 4 plus 2 cosine 12. Okay. 3 times, so 2 cosine 12 plus 2 comma. Sixteen, over 10. yeah, four squared over ten, okay, plus one, okay. We can clean that up just a little bit. This would be six plus two cosine twelve, comma, uh, eight fifths plus one would be thirteen fifths. Okay, now all we would have to do was with a graphing, well, with a calculator, be in degree mode and you know, plug in what 12, cosine 12 is. I'm not in degree mode, radian mode. Plug in what cosine 12 radius is and do that calculation, whatever it turns out to be. And they claimed it came out. Uh, Seven point six nine, which yeah, that sounds reasonable. Comma and thirteen fifths is two point six. Okay, no no doubt about that. All right, that finishes thirteen two. Sorry, tough. That is so messed up. Okay, is this a figure of that? I think it is. Let me uh, clear some of this out of the way. I would say I'm going to erase it all, but I think it, let's leave. Okay. I think that's all right. Goodness, my throat's hurting. All right. So here's the particle path. Uh, R of t equal to this. This is when we know that t equals zero. You're here at four one. That's where you begin. This is where you go. If t is equal to four, you're over here at. 7.69, so that would be 6, 7, 8, 7.69, just a little over halfway, and up at 2.6. Okay. Um, okay. All right, let's, do you want to do preliminary questions, bottom of the page? 703, do you find them helpful? I know. Do you find them helpful? Okay. All right. Let's see. I'm going to go back here and erase what I got. All right. On this slide. State the three forms of the product rule for vector value functions. Okay. You want to see it? Yeah. Oh, wait. You don't have this. So uh, maybe I should state them. Okay, um, we'll first do the product rule of a scalar times a vector. So d by dt of some f of t r of t, where r is a vector. What would that be? Uh, f of t. Uh, goodness gracious, I should write that. I say F, I go to write F and write a D. I don't know. Ugh. F of T. Derivative of R of T. Plus. L prime of T. Times D of T. R of T. 
Okay. Dot. For some reason, they did it backwards, but it's okay. It's perfectly fine. Uh, got it. So that's a scalar function times a vector function. There's two types of multiplying vectors. What are they? Two types of multiplication you would can, you can do with vectors. Yes, exactly, a dot. So we'll do R of T dot. Yeah, I was just trying to see if they chose anything. How about R1 and R2? I don't know if that's what they use or not. Let me see. Yeah, that's what they use. R2 of T. Okay, both vector value functions. Say, so what should that give you? What's that? A scalar? Yeah, it definitely will be a scalar, but what is the value of that scalar? Okay, okay, it would be R1 of T, just like you did before, dotted with R2 prime of T plus R1 of T Uh, goodness gracious. I was saying one thing, and for some reason, something else is getting written. Plus R1 prime of T dotted with R2 of T. Okay. Now that's the definition for it. Uh, there's not really a lot you can do to simplify that, but as you sort of suggested before, a dot product produces a scalar, so this becomes a scalar, that becomes a scalar, you have your two scalars up and you get it. Uh, okay, and that's... All they do, for some reason, they write their R1 prime first and R2 second. It doesn't matter, okay? And then what's the second kind of multiplying vector functions? Cross product. Cross product. Oh, okay. R1 of T cross R2 of T. Okay. What would that be? Um, I don't know how we spec that out. I mean, I know how to do it, but I don't know how we spec Well, tell me how to do it. Oh, you mean I, J, K, yeah, okay. Like that, so. okay, okay, but let's do it sort of shorthand, so concise, basically just like we did before, R1 of T crossed with R2 prime of T plus R1 prime of T crossed with R2 of T. Yeah, I mean, why not? Okay. Now, here's the deal. With scalar functions, this is sort of interesting here, uh, multiplying a scalar times a vector, you still get a scalar times a vector. Okay? The R's and R primes are both vectors, and you, you know, just combine those things together. With a dot product, however, and you call this a scalar product, this is called a dot product, but your answer is a scalar, okay? And again, it doesn't matter which order 
you did these, they're perfectly fine, and that one is perfectly fine. Now down here, in fact, you could have swapped this order and swapped that order. It didn't matter because dot products are scalars. But down here, it does matter. Now it doesn't matter which side of the plus sign you put them. This is going to be a vector, that's going to be a vector. When you add vector, you just add the components. But do not ever change the order of R1 and R2 because then when you cross a cross product and you switch order, you get the minus. Right hand rule, change the order and you, you, you change the direction. So that, therefore you do that. And it, again, it doesn't matter. I'll bet you the book did the R1 prime first, and they did. And they went so far as to put them in brackets so you can tell they are indeed separate vectors that you're adding. I drew that bracket over the plus sign. But they drew this one first and then that one, but it still comes out the same. Okay. Now, lost my face. There it is. Okay. So state the three forms of the product rule for vector value functions. The scalar product rule, or scalar function rule, I guess you would call it, uh, scalar function times a vector, a, the dot product rule, and the cross product rule. In questions two through six, indicate whether the statement is true or false, and if it is false, provide a correct statement. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. You going what? Okay. Okay. I'll be through. At, uh, what is it? One fifty-five. Yeah. So I'll step in there then. Okay. Okay, so let me clear the screen here. I'm not sure what that's about, but I think I may have a guess. Okay. I wish you had a book. Okay, here's number two. Oh, yeah, if there's a lot here right now. Well, it's just having to write it. I don't know if reading it will be good enough. The derivative of a vector valued function is defined as the limit of the difference quotient just as in the scalar value case. Oh, and by the way, let's just check and make sure what we had before, which I've already erased, uh, was what they were looking for. This is 13, 2. Here it is. Yeah, D but e, yeah. And in fact, in the back of the book, they write it the way I did, whereas on the summary, they wrote it the other order. But it doesn't matter which order. Uh, and in the back of the book, they didn't put those last two in brackets either. So, yeah. Okay, and that is indeed true. Okay. The derivative of a vector value function is defined as the limit of the difference quotient. It's just now you have difference of vector vector difference, okay, as in the scalar, just as just as in the scalar scalar value case. Uh. Number three, there are two chain rules for vector value functions: one for the composite of two vector value functions, and one for the composite of a vector value and a scalar value function. Um, I would tend to say not because you, you have no way of defining a uh, composite of two vector value functions. It, it just, I, I, I can't for the Think of me. See, a composite of a vector with a scalar value function, this is number three, by the way, uh, that would be um, R of G of T, where G is a scalar function, and that, and you can do a chain rule of that. But what does it mean, R1 of R2 of T? That concept doesn't even make any sense. Uh, 
because you can't have a one vector function evaluated at another vector. You can have it evaluated at a scalar value, but not at a vector value. So no, the, that one doesn't make any sense. There's only one chain rule, and that's for a composite of a vector with a scalar function. Okay, uh, they don't. That's all they said. Okay. Number four, the terms velocity vector and tangent vector for a path R of t mean one and the same thing. Yeah, false. false. You're absolutely right because a tangent vector can be any length whatsoever. It just all has to be as tangent. Yeah. Velocity vector is a specific vector. So that had better be false. No, they say it's true. <laughs> okay, goodness gracious. I'm not sure I buy that. Okay. Uh, Second. The terms velocity vector and tangent vector for a path R of t mean one and the same thing. I guess what they mean is both of them are prime of t. You can call that the the velocity vector. You can call it the tangent vector. It's, in that sense, it's, I thought they meant a tangent vector, but they what they're saying is the tangent vector. Or they don't say the, but I think that's what they're meaning then. Okay. Number five, the derivative of a vectored value function is the slope of the tangent line just as in the scalar case. Derivative of a vector value function is the slope of the tangent line just as in the scalar value case. Uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking it is. I'm trying to think of why it's false. So, uh, the derivative of a vector value function is the slope of the tangent line just as in the scalar case. Okay, I, I think the reason, let me see if it's false. I believe it is. Five is false. Okay, and I think this is the reason why. Uh, the better thing is to call it a tangent vector or velocity vector uh, because the concept of slope when you get out of two dimension doesn't really make a lot of sense. Slope makes sense as a change of y over a change of x. Yeah, but if you have derivative of a three or a larger dimension vector, and even a two dimension vector, uh, that is. So, yeah, I guess it's still slope would be, make some sense there. But three-dimensional vectors, <laughs> how do you define a slope then? Because there's not one independent, one dependent variable. They're all, yeah. So I, even there, I think probably not, okay? Uh, so that's false, okay? Number six, the derivative of the cross product is the cross product of the derivatives. The derivative of a cross product is the cross product of the derivatives. False. I would say false. Now, if they're true, I don't know. Uh, which is that number? Six. Yeah, that's false. Got to be. Because it's it's the first time derivative of the second. Yeah, cross it. Yeah. So it can't be the derivative of the, yeah. That can't be. Okay, number seven. Okay, that was all the true-false. State whether the following derivatives of vector value functions, R1 and R2, are scalars of R vectors. Okay, so here we have two vectors, R1 of t 
and R2 of T. Both are vector functions. Okay? State whether the following derivatives of pro vector value functions R1 and R2 are scalars or vectors. Okay? Here's A. D by DT of R1 of T. Scalar or vector? Vector, you're absolutely right. B. D by DT of R1 of T dot R2 of T. Scalar, because the dot products are scalar, so how can you have a derivative of the scalar suddenly become a vector? And let's see C. D by DT of R1 of T cross R2 of T. That's a vector. So it should be vector, scalar, vector. Vector, scalar, vector. Got it. All right. Homework exercises here. Do any of the odds 1 through 5? Do any of the odds 7 through 11? Do any, do either 13 or 15 or both. Do either 17 or 19 or both. Do 21. Do either 23 or 25 or both. Do 27. Do any of the odds 29 to 33? Do either 35 or 37 or both. Do any of the odds 39 to 45 and any of the odds 47 to 53. Um, do any of the odds 55 through Oh, yeah. yeah, through, I think it's 63. Now, you can look at 65 if you'd like. It's one that says the writing exercise. But let me point out to you, uh, 63 is the Bernoulli spiral. And uh, you can either write on that and how Bernoulli came up with it, or more specifically, which Bernoulli came up with it. Because the Renoulis were a huge family of great mathematicians and physicists, you know. And uh, there was two brothers to start with, and each of them had some sons. Uh, may have even had some daughters who were good mathematicians. I've never read about them. But there's like at least two and maybe three generations of multiple Renoulis. <laughs> okay, so you... you uh, uh, you can write on the Bernoulli family, whichever Bernoulli did this, how that Bernoulli did this, or what it's used for, or anything such as that. So, uh, and then there's also some on torque and mo angular momentum, if you wanted to chase that down, but I'm not sure you could find enough good resource for that. So I guess that brings us basically almost to the end. Sorry I had to break in the middle. Uh, so we didn't get as much covered as I wanted to, but we'll stop.